So I'm I'm curious to find out like because there's there's so many directions I want to go with this uh, go with you on this, Jen. So so bear with me because I guess the the thing I struggle with is I I kind of I've always come from the other side where I was raised very conservative, and as I've gotten older, I find myself less and less conservative because I find that like it becomes too much of a group think on that side as well. Yeah, and, I and find I guess, people like us meet in the middle often. Yeah, like I feel like people that are super Democrat don't really like me. People that are super conservative don't really oh. like me because I'm not enough of either. And I got and, and that I, too. I guess like how have we gotten to this point where people have stopped to question? That's what I'm curious because you're somebody that, you know, you've questioned a lot in your career. And I know you you yeah. said that they've often in the past called you um, the velvet hammer because of your ability to question correctly, but in the in, in the best way possible. Why have we stopped yeah. questioning? Um, I just think that the polarization in this country is so great and the the minority on both sides, you know, the loud, vocal, bullying minorities, they on both the right and the left, they seem to have the microphone and they terrify everybody in the middle. People like us, you know, moderates, um, people who don't necessarily line up with the platform of either the, of either party. And the problem is most people are not like us where they'll continue to speak out and continue to engage. They just retreat and they get very quiet. So what appears to happen then is that you have a consensus on the left, which is the very far most extreme version because they're the loudest people. And you have a consensus on the right because the very far right most extreme version have the mic. When the fact is most people have common sense are able to think for themselves, I think. May, I might take that back. Um, but at the very least are willing to question things, but only in the privacy of their own home because they see what happens to people like me, you know, the way they are ousted from polite society, the names they get called. I mean, in San Francisco, these are the names I was called for advocating for open schools. This is just a short representation of the names I was called publicly. Racist, white supremacist, QAnon, which I didn't even know what that was, and I had to look it up. Alt-right, um, uh, Christian alt-right. You know, meanwhile, I'm a Jewish atheist. Um, I mean, I get called a Christian nationalist, uh, Republican, which is a curse word in San Francisco. Just go. Um, and so, you know, if you see that happening publicly and you're sort of a moderate Democrat in San Francisco and you see someone that you might agree with on some things that you think is asking reasonable questions, but you see what happens to them, that they literally get ousted from their community, their city, et cetera. Why would you risk it? I mean, I would say you have to risk it because those of us who believe in free speech and asking questions and rational debate, diplomatic engagement. Um, we have to take the mic back. But it just, you know, I think that that's part of it is the most extremes on either side have the microphone. The other problem is there is no daylight at this point, And this is why I'm so critical of the left. You know, the far left has co-opted big business, media, university systems, and so there's no daylight between any of those things. You know, the media who I hold accountable for the disaster that was COVID restrictions because they failed to interrogate the assertions from public health. Like, what happened to the media? What, are, they're supposed to be adversarial. They're supposed to be questioning those with power. And instead, they publish the talking points from public health and the government as if they were news. And so I think that's part of the problem also. And so you can, they, they sort of manufacture this consensus. And so like these regular normies like you and me in the middle, which we may not agree on everything, but we can have a rational, reasonable conversation. Right. Um, you know, we feel that we're in this like really tiny minority because the establishment has put forth one view, which a minority holds, but it feels like the majority, if that makes sense. I mean, if we take the issue of my brand <clears throat> and what we're standing up for, we're standing up for the protection of women's sports and spaces. The most recent polls indicate that 70% of Americans agree with us. Now, I will tell you as somebody who's standing up loudly for this issue as both a former athlete and a sentient human being, um, it doesn't feel like we're the majority when you stand up. Yes. It doesn't. And so that's because the vast majority of people who agree with us are silent. It's, because they're it's, scared. It's kind of wild to me, though, because I know especially with this, like, people are arguing on biology, which it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. And it doesn't make 
a woman better than a man or a man better than a woman. Just like biologically, we're different, right? Like if if you took you know I, uh, one of the, the the worst men's players in the in the NBA and put him in the WNBA, he'd likely dominate because just men are bigger would, structured and we're built he differently. Would kill. Yeah, but like he if you would say kill. that, like you're a misogynist and you're this and you're that, but it like it, it's just reality. And for some reason, we're not able to agree on what's real. Yeah. I mean, our language has been absolutely corrupted, and that's why I've become pretty adamant about not succumbing to the sort of language that's forced upon us. Pronouns, uh, trans women are women. Um, These things become part of the ether, and automatically everyone starts parroting them out of, I guess, some sense of politeness. Uh, And this is where it leads us. You know, once you have agreed Because you've said it, even if you don't agree, that trans women are women, how do you say that person can't compete in the women's category? You can't. They are women. Um, And it's been corrupted to the point where you have the head of the International Olympic Committee standing up and saying there is no reliable test to determine sex eligibility. I mean, that is a lie. He said that last week. He said that's why we don't do sex eligibility testing. There is no reliable test. It's a point blank lie. There's a very reliable, uninvasive test. It's a cheek swab. (laughs) It's not a big deal. Uh, But he says it and it becomes truth. And then all the sheep start, I hate using, you know, the language, but like they just start parroting it as if it's truth. Suddenly there's no reliable test for sex eligibility. It's cogwash. And so I do think it's really important and it might seem like, you know, I'm being a stickler, but I will not adopt this language. It smuggles in really pernicious ideas into the culture. And it happened during COVID as well. I'm I'm curious the two, um, it seems like these two things are are married in a lot of ways. Like to to me, like people that woke up from the pandemic also woke up to a lot of the gender stuff. And I'm 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 curious if that's something you've seen and experienced soon. If you have, like why do you think that is? It's such a good question. I talk about this with my husband all the time. Um it seems there's like 100% overlap. And I would say it, you know, I'll speak to the the cohort that I really identify with, which is sort of disaffected lefties who, you know, during COVID said, this is such a trespass of all of the reasons I was a Democrat to begin with. Like, how can the party say that they stand up for the vulnerable, they care about free speech, uh, small businesses, children, um, just basic civil liberties when they're willing to do this. And it's, it's it's a hundred percent overlap overlap. The the former lefties or disaffected lefties who saw that during COVID and now see the folly of this gender ideology. And I think the thing is it's because it's the same playbook. You know, these taglines um that become part of the way that we talk as if we always talk this way and always knew this, but they're just marketing taglines. Stay home to stay safe. Everyone's at equal risk. Two weeks to flatten the curve. Um, Shelter in place. I mean, I remember at the beginning of COVID, everybody started shouting shelter in place. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, is this some word? Is this something I'm supposed to know what it is? I've never heard of it. 